All right, so hello everybody. My name is Francisco Martua, and today I'm going to show you guys my midterm exam for mathematics for economics two. All right, so wait. All right, now question number one. We are asked to, to show that if marginal cost of production is constant and there is no effect of the imposition of the quota in country two on the price and the output in country one. Now we explain, we are going to explain this result. Now to, um, to do this, we're first, we're going to find our profit function, which is TR minus TC. Now, as we, as we all know, um, we have two goods here, which is from country one and con country two. So we have two separate total revenue. One is from country one and country, country two. Now, essentially from country one, um, the total revenue is P1 times Q1. And then for country two, this is P1 times Q2, uh, P2 times Q2. Now, the assumption says that the cost should be constant. Now, um, as we all know, the cost for the total cost is the cost times quantity. Now, as the cost is constant for both Q1 and Q2, we could have this assumption that C, open bracket, Q1 plus Q2, close bracket. Now, to do this is, the next step is to derive the equation with respect to Q1 and Q2, the profit function um, with respect to Q1 and Q2. Now, d pi over dq1 is equals to this. Now, you may ask me, where do I found the, this value? The answer is from expanding d over dq1 to each of the respective variables um, of the equation. And then finally, we have dp1 over dq1 times q1 plus p1 minus c. Now, same goes for the dp2 over dq2. We will have d over dq2 times q2 plus p2 minus c. Now, from this, we can, um, we can um, conclude that q2 uh, when there's some quota imposed on Q2, it would um, affect the optimal value for Q2. Hence, um, when it limits the number of Q2, it will not satisfy the function of dp, d pi over dq2 itself. It will not satisfy the, der the derivative of that since it is not the optimal value. Now, you may ask me why there's no effect to C because as the assumption stated before, the cost is constant. Now we're going to discuss the effect on P1 and Q1. Now, uh, my conclusion is that there will be no um, effect on P1 and Q1. The reason is that as seen from the, the derivative of d pi over dq1, we know that the only factor affecting optimal Q1 is Q1 itself, P1 and the cost. Here you can see Q, the only affecting uh, value for the optimal Q1 is Q1 itself, P1 and C. As we know, C is constant, therefore the only affecting one is P1 and Q1. Now here the question says that it, it imposed a quota on country two. That means uh, Q2 is affected, right? But then since there is no variable of Q2 whatsoever in the optimal uh, optimization of Q1, we can conclude that it will not affect any of them. Here, since we know that the constant at the C is constant and there's no variable Q2 in the equation, we can conclude that Q1 and Q1 will remain the same. Now, moving on to question two, we are asked to solve um, the constraint optimization. In this case, we have this utility function. And then we're asked to derive the demand um, function and then discuss their properties as well as comparing the demand function with um, the Cobb Douglas example. Now, the first approach is to use the Lagrange equation. As we can see here, our utility is as such, and then significant to our constraint, which is P1x1 plus P2x2 is equal to I. Where do I get this? Uh, this is basically our total income. Here, I put I is equal to uh, which, which means income. And then we create our Lagrange equation as we do this routinely, uh, we know that x1, our utility function plus lambda, 
um, the bracket of i minus p1 x1 minus p2 x2. Next step is we're going to derive the equation with respect to each variable that we're trying to find, which is x1, x2. Um, I'm so sorry, there, is such, uh, there should not be x3 here, and lambda. Now, dl over dx1. Um, over dx1, um, that means this, uh, we know it, it has a power of a, and then we derive this with a x1 minus c1 to the power of a minus 1. c2 and x2 will remain the same, minus lambda p1 is equals to 0. Same goes for dl over dx2. Uh, in this case, our power is 1 minus a, we put that to the front, and then 1 minus a minus 1, which will give us uh, minus a, and then x1 and c1 will remain the same, minus lambda times p2, because the only very, uh, the only number here is 1, x2, uh, the value is 1, before it's going to be um, erased. And then equate both of them is equal to 0. And then lastly is the dl over d lambda, which is essentially the constraint function. Next, um, we are going to equate um, lambda is equal to lambda, which will give us this equation. Now, by using um, simple cross multiplication, we found that P1 over P2 is equal to A x1 minus C1 to the power of A minus 1 times x2 minus C2 to the power of 1 minus A over 1 minus a, x1 minus c1 to the power of a, and x2 minus c2 to the power of negative a. Now, using simple indices, we are going to have the value of p1 over p2 um, as this, a times x2 minus c2 divided by 1 minus a times x1 minus c1. Now, there's two approach here. After this, we you can either solve for x2 or x1. In this case, I'm going to solve for x2 since it's easier. Now, therefore, we make x2 as a subject. And then using some simple algebra, we have this value, p1 times 1 minus a, x1 minus c1 over p2a plus c2. I'm so sorry, um, to clarify this, a is alpha, the same as alpha. I don't have the um, symbol for alpha, therefore I, I use a. Now, after we found x2, and we're going to plug it into the constraint uh, equation. Now, from this, we will solve the demand equation for x1. This is our constraint, p1, x1, p2, x2. We substitute x2 with this. And then is equals to i. And then after doing some expansion and um, um, crossing out the variables, we will have x1, our demand function for x1, which is this. Now you may ask um, if you would like to see the process of getting to x1, this is the process. Now here it starts that um, from here, I essentially I cross out p2 with p2, and which was, will give us this, and then p2 times c2, which, was, which will give us this. Now what I did is that I make p1 times 1 minus alpha as a as a whole unit and then i multiplied by x i multiplied to x1 and then c1 which will gives us this now we're going to expand p1 and x1 as a unit multiplied by 1 minus alpha same goes for this one we will have this now as you can see here there are some variables that are the same i cross them out then such as this, alpha and alpha, and then this will give us um, the new equation, which is this. Now we want to eliminate, uh, we want to isolate x1 since we're trying to find the demand function for x1. Um, therefore, I put x1 to the left and put the equal sign here. And then the rest follows. And then x1 times p1 over alpha, P1 and alpha, I move it to the right, which will give us this. Now, from here, I expand the alpha over P1 to each of the following variables, and it will give us this, which is essentially our demand function for x1. Right, after we found the value, the demand function for F, F, x1, we're going to use that value to find the x2. Here's the way. 
uh, using our original x2 function, which is p1 1 minus a times x1 minus c1 plus c2 over p2a. Um, here we have our x1, and then since our and since we already know our equation for x1, we substitute it again. Here, this is the long way of doing it. I expand one by one, and then crossing out some values such as alpha and alpha here, and then alpha and alpha here. P2, P2, alpha, alpha, we cross out that. And then simplify everything. We have the new demand, fun uh, the demand function for x2, which is this. Now we have solved the demand function for x1 and x2 using the Lagrange equation. Now we're asked to compare them with the Cobb Douglas example. So what you need to do with the Cobb Douglas example is first of all, you find the marginal utility for x1 and x2. Um, it's just basically deriving the utility function with respect to um, Q1 and Q2. And then for maximizing the marginal utility, you equate them both to zero and then you equate them together and then divide them with respect their um, dollar per dollar. This In this order, we will maximize the marginal utility. As I said previously, this is our utility function subject to our constraint, which is y is equals to p1 x1 plus p2 x2. Again, as I said previously, um, we find, well, first of all, we try to find the marginal utility for x1 which is basically deriving du uh, in terms of x1. We have this of alt a times x1 minus c1 power of a minus one times x2 minus c2 power of one minus a is equal to zero. Same goes for the marginal, marginal utility for x2. We derive the utility function with respect to x2. We have one minus a times x1 minus c1 to the power of a times x2 minus c2 to the power of one minus a is equal to zero. Now, um, as mentioned previously, again, from this, we maximize the marginal utility by using this following formula. We know what is mu x1, we know what is mu x2, we substitute the, this with this, and then mu x2 with this, we have this. Now, um, and this may look very similar, which ended, which ended is the same as our previous equation using the Lagrange. We will have P1 over P2 is equal to this. Now from here, we can conclude that um, the demand function for X2 and the demand function for X1 will be the same regardless of using um, Cobb-Douglas or the Lagrange equations, hence satisfying the question itself here and compare the demand function derived from the cup Douglas. Right. Now that is done with question two. Now we are going to the last question, which is question three. Here we are asked to solve the cost minimization problem. Here's the function, the minimum, uh, we're asked to minimize WL plus RK plus VR subject to the constraint function itself, which is R to the power of A times L plus BK to the power of C minus uh, Y more than or equals to, bigger than or equals to zero. We know here R is raw material, L is labor, K is capital, then ABC is bigger than zero with A plus one less than one. Now we're going to interpret the production function in this problem. All right, to begin with, as usual, um, as our topic, we're going to use our, our daily Lagrange equation. Here I wrote negative because this is um, WL plus RK plus VR essentially is not a function yet. So I'm going to equate this equal to zero. And then I move this to the right, which will give me negative. And then I put F here as a subject for the function itself. Now, um, creating our Lagrange equation, we will have the function itself plus lambda multiplied by the contrary equation. After that, we're going to derive this with respect to each variable, just L, R, K, and lambda. Now, um, here I put one, two, and three because we have because from our previous um, 
questions, we only have we usually have two examples where it is easy just to equate the first lambda and the second lambda, but then we have three lambdas here. So to do that, you need to equate first lambda with second lambda, second lambda with third lambda, and then the third lambda with the first lambda. And then the last one is dl over d lambda, which is the constraint function itself is equal to zero. And okay, now um, we equate so um, one and two, two and three, three and one from the from the lambdas. Now the final value for equating the first and the second lambda we, gives us w over r is equals to one over b. Now equating the second and the third lambda gives us this value. R over V is equals to R times B times C over A uh, times L plus BK. Now the, uh, the last one, which is equating the third and the first lambda, we have w, w over V is equals to C times R over A times L plus BK. Now, this is the way of the proof of me doing it, where do I get um, W over, over R equals to one over B, which is this. I equate the first and the second lambda. I cross out this value. I cross out R to the power of A, this is the same. And then same goes for C times L plus BK to the power of C minus one. It has the same for both. So I can cross this out. So uh, it only leaves us with W. R and B. Simple cross multiplication. We have R W over R is equal to one over B. Now the second and third. This is the um, second lambda. This is the third lambda here. This is V, by the way. Uh, we look at this. Uh, there's nothing that we can cross out except. We use some simple cross multiplication and basic indices, so such as this. This is essentially uh, the power of C is going to be reduced by the denominator here, as well as A minus 1 is going to be reduced by A. So C minus C minus 1, we, we will have more of 1. Therefore, I put the L plus BK up here, whereas the R. R to the power of a minus one minus R, which will gives us R to the power of minus one, which is exact, uh, essentially the same as one over R. Now from here, I use co again cross multiplication, which will give me the value of R, to, uh, R over V is equals to RBC over A times L plus BK. Now lastly, it's going to equate the third and the first lambda. Here we have the third, and the first lambda, again, similar to the second and third, we're going to do some indices here. In this case, C minus 1 minus C, which will give us minus 1. And then A minus A minus 1, which will give us R to the power of 1. Now, again, L uh, plus B, K to the power of negative 1 is just the same as 1 over L plus B, K. Therefore, I, I put this uh, value to the denominator, and then this is our subject, W over V is equals to this. Now, next up, um, we got to remember the, I'm going to use the second and third um, equation, which is this, R over V is equals to RBC over A times L plus BK, All right? And then since we know that, Equating the first and the second um, lambda, we have uh, W over R is equal to 1 over B. And then cross multiplication, we have WB is equal to R, which will be important here. Now we have the, our, first, our first equation. Then we substitute R with WB. So it will be WB over V is equal to RBC over A times L plus BK. Now, it has uh, two of the same subject here, B, WB, and RB here. We can cross the, both of Bs. And then um, we um, use, um, what is it called? The uh, cross multiplication 
we have WA times L plus BK is equals to RCV. I'm sorry, this should be in lowercase. Now, the next step is to eliminate the function, this function, the new one, with our original function here to find the values in terms of R, L, and K. Now, here we have R, A, L, B, K is equal to V, R, C, B. We have W, A plus F times L plus B, K is equal to V, R, C. Now we eliminate this. I found this. Why, where did I get this? It's, um, essentially, I take out the same subject, which is A times L plus B, K. And then the only thing that is different is R and W. And in this case, we are eliminating it. That means we are going to sub subtract R with W and then using some, you know, categorizing, we get this um, value. Same goes for the right-hand side, VRC and VRCB. The only difference is that it, this is B and um, one, minus one. So if you, Expand this VRC times B and then VRC times minus one, it will have the um, long equation itself, the actual value. Yeah. Now, what I'm what I'm about to do is to make LB plus uh, no L plus BK over R as a subject and then remove everything to the right. Now this is important because in this form, in this way, this is easier for us to substitute back to the original constraint um, equation. This is what I mean. Um, here, our original constraint equation is this. Now we have L plus BK, but then we have L plus BK over R. So what are we supposed to do with it in order to fit in the equation? What I did is to force, to somehow force, um, R so that it has the it has the power of C. This is what I mean. Essentially, we only have L plus B K, right? We don't have R divided by R C. But then I use this. Um, I force this R power of C over R power of C, which is essentially times one, which is the same. But then here we have L plus B K power of C R power of C. From this indices, we know that. It is the same as L plus BK over R bracket to the power of C. Now, it leaves us with the left uh, one, which is R to the power of A and then R to the power of C. Again, so using simple indices, we know that it will give us R to the power of A plus C. Now, this is bigger than C. All right, so we know that L plus BK over R, we already have the value from the previous one, which is VC times B minus one over A times R minus W, we substitute back here since we're eligible now to our constraint equation, bigger than Y. Now we make R as a subject as it is one of the, as it is the only remaining um, variable that's left from the original objective function. Now R should be, big. Um, we do simple algebra, we get this whole thing right here. Now, the conclusion is that based from so the conclusion is that r should be bigger than this in order to minimize the cost because our at our final um, equation we don't have l no more we don't have k no more the only remaining um, subject that we have from the original uh, objective function is r so to interpret this we can assume that from the previous one, R should be bigger than the value. It needs to satisfy that in order to minimize the cost. Yep, and then that is it for me. Um, thank you very much.